Every year, Startup Grind hosts our SG Women Leaders Month, proudly recognizing the accomplishments of successful women leaders all over the world. These women are founders, venture capitalists, engineers, executives, educators, and more who represent our community all around the world. This month's SG Women Month is proudly presented by Google for Startups and Silicon Valley Bank. Welcome again, everyone. And thank you very much to Elena Guerinez, um, Rita Pizarra, and Ines Santos Silva. Uh, Elena Guerinez is in charge of Gender Balance Project at Instituto Tecnico de Lisboa. Uh, Rita Pizarra is the CFO uh, of Microsoft Portugal. And Ines Santos Silva, uh, she is the Chief Activist Officer and co-founder at Portuguese uh, Women in Tech, among a lot of other things that I know that Ines uh, does. Um, and uh, here we are, uh, Madalena, uh, co-director of uh, Startup Grind Lisbon, and myself, I'm Stella Swills, I'm the director, and we have two other members um, that might be joining as well, or might be also part of the participants. Um, who is Fernando Jardim and Luciana Carvalho. Uh, so we are very new uh, with the Startup Grand Lisbon. We just started doing events last month. Was it last month, right? Yeah. It just feels like we did so many events on, on, on two months that it feels like we have been longer. Uh, but yeah, we are super excited. Um, one, of the, one of our motivations is to make sure we showcase positive uh, role models. Uh, for people to become entrepreneurs, especially um, having a balance on gender. So this month uh, is a startup grind um, woman month. Uh, we were super excited that it was our second month live. So we decided to, to make a few panels uh, to talk about different subjects. Last week we were talking about uh, women founders. And this week we are talking about why we need why we still need women in tech events and that's the question that we are gonna we're gonna talk today um but before that let me introduce a bit the startup grind which is a global community um they have we have chapters like us in 600 cities around 125 countries and what we really like from a startup grind are the values uh, which is we believe in making personal contacts we believe in giving not taking, and we believe in helping others before helping ourselves. They really resonate with uh, the personal um, and professional work we both, uh, we actually all, all of us do. Um, so we, we really wanted to launch this in, in Lisbon. And now, so let me start with the questions. Um, so what, as we were saying before, in uh, Portugal has been a mark as uh, one of the best countries for women pursuing a career in technology. And we would like to ask um, our attendees, what is Portugal doing to be at the top of the list? And any of you um, can go, Elena, Rita, or Inesh. Okay. Just admit yourself and, and go for it. <laughs> um, I can start, I can, do, I can say something about that. Uh, um, first, I, I, I want to uh, I want to say that it's a privilege to be here and uh, and to be invited for this uh, forum. And uh, um, also, um, I want to welcome everybody uh, that is joining the meeting. Okay, concerning your question, uh, I think that. Uh, uh, this study that uh, was done, uh, they, um, the index that was studied uh, show that the gender pay gap between the overall economy and the tech industry is the smallest across 41 countries. And that's true for Portugal. Um, so uh, what, what, what implications does this have is that Choosing a career in technology is economically less risky for women in Portugal than in other countries. And uh, that's what the Portuguese women did. They chose a career uh, in uh, technology because 
economically is less risky. That's my approach. It's funny, I can compliment. It's funny that you mentioned uh, that, that aspect of the study, because when I think about myself, um, before I joined Microsoft, I worked for Deloitte. Uh, and I didn't have a life, okay? I worked from 8 a.m. to 3 a.m. every day. I didn't know where I was gonna be my birthday and so forth. Um, and at some point in time, I was auditing Microsoft and there was an opening uh, there in, you know, I got offered a position and when I went home and I told my dad, you know, dad, I'm, I'm joining Microsoft. And this was 15 years ago. Okay. I'm joining Microsoft. And he said, you're joining what? You know, Microsoft wasn't the big tech company and computers were, you know, starting. And he was like, are you crazy? What are you doing? You have a stable job. You know, you're moving to a technological company. What are you doing? What do you have your head? And, and it, it I like how you framed it because now when I think about it, it's the complete opposite. Even on this, in this situation that we're living right now in COVID situation, when you link, we think about other industries such as, you know, travel industry and uh, oil, gas, all those industries are suffering heavily with the COVID impact and, and IT is the industry that is prevailing above all technology. So I agree with you, it is, and, and we always have this sense, it's very Portuguese, we always have this sense of having a secure job, making sure that we are secure on what we do, that we have a paycheck at the end of the day, that we can predict uh, what is gonna happen in our lives. And IT is the place to be, is the place to be for us to have a stable job, to, to make sure that we are, as being a surfer, being surfing the right wave at the right time, uh, IT is the place to be, and I don't regret any day the change that I've done to move to to Microsoft 15 years ago. And if my father was alive, I think he would be proud uh, that I made the change. So I couldn't agree more with your with your perspective, Elena. Yeah, I, I would like to add a few things. I think, first of all, uh, thank you, Stella and Madalena, for inviting me. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be here and share a little bit about the work that I'm doing, but also my view on, on the tech scene. Uh, I think, first, uh, like when, whenever I look at the, the ranking, I think it's very positive to see Portugal in the first place, um, and I think and that's and that's very good. But even though that's true, I, when I look at the, the data, I don't feel as positive as, um, as when I look at the overall, uh, the idea that we are in first place. Because still, fortunately, if you look at the data, we only have 16% of the people that work in, um, in, tech, in tech are women, which means that it's actually very uh, below the European average. And this is like, this study says 16%. I saw other studies that show that it's 14%. Um, and that's uh, also not very, uh, very good. Where we stand out is also the fact that we have 30% um, of, the, of the people working in STEM uh, uh, are women. And there's other studies that show that 50, more than 50% of, of, of the people um, studying uh, STEM are women as well. So I think what we are seeing is that even though we have a lot of women studying uh, STEM, which has uh, science, technology, and so on, um, we, we don't have that many people then going into technology. And I think that's actually a, a very big question to ask because a lot of the times when we have these conversations and, and the easy answer is like, ah, some people are like, ah, women don't like uh, math or science. But if you look at the data, we clearly see that women in Portugal love math and science. Um, the, but for some reason, we are not seeing women uh, going into technology, and that's why we only have, at least uh, according to this study, only 60% are actually uh, in technology. And even though I'm very positive, and, uh, and for example, with the Portuguese women in tech, we actually did a study, I have it here, the Pioneer study, yeah. Um, we did a study uh, last year to, to see uh, what's the reality of women in technology in Portugal? And there is like a lot of women that are still the only one in their company, the only one in their department working uh, uh, basically with this, this technology background. There is still a lot of like um, uh, perceived sexual discrimination in the workplace. So even though we've done a lot of things uh, well and we rank number one, I think we still have a long way to go before we actually feel like women are very, uh, uh, have a place in the in this field. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, for your contribution. And yeah, that, that study for the pioneers uh, was really useful as well, Dinesh. I use the data a few times when I do um, workshops. Uh, I, think, I think it's really important um, to measure, right? Because as, as you were saying as well, um, uh, Elena and, and Rita, like each study also, or, and you also were, were saying that, uh, Inesh, like each study gives a different set of data depending on what they measure. So I think um, it, it's really important to keep track and, and make sure that we are, we are always improving um, because it has, uh, as you were also saying, Rita, it has a kind of a connotation, at least before it used to be like a very masculine uh, profession. And, and unfortunately, we, we, we have to fight with, with those stereotypes. Um, so as, as we all agree, the percentage, even when we are doing really good, the percentage are not 50-50 yet. Um, so why is, in your opinion, why are, in your opinion, women a minority in tech? Are there any main reasons? Uh, you see, I, I've heard some of you talking about, about uh, stereotypes and, and things, but what else, what would you say are some of the reasons, uh, in your opinion? Um, I can go uh, first. Um, so it, it's very. This is a very, very interesting topic because uh, in the beginning there was only hardware, and hardware was done by men. Um, and then there was software, and software was only done by women. So if you look back at the Second World War, for example, and it's a very interesting example, um, women were the ones doing software, men men were the ones doing hardware. Um, but then over, over the years, uh, what we start seeing was women basically retiring from the tech industry. Um, and then there was, I think it was in the 70s, uh, this study that showed that the best uh, uh, software developer was someone that didn't like, uh, didn't like people and did like puzzles a lot and was very introverted. And for some reason, we associate this kind of, uh, basically, we we accepted, or as a, a, a the industry, the tech industry, accept this as as a fact, and then start looking for people that didn't like other people, that like puzzles and math, and um, and uh, and basically this start condition our uh, our brain around like who is the be who can be the best um, software developers, and there, basically since then we have been um, creating this stereotype around us about who. Who, who should be a software developer, but for, for some reason most women don't fit this, uh, this criteria. And a lot of this sometimes is unconscious, it's not like uh, people are not necessarily putting in job app, uh, ads, ah, you should be, uh, have this or that characteristics, but for some reason this is something that has been taken um, into account and is, uh, is basically a stereotype. Sometimes I go to schools and ask people to close their eyes and think about the software pro, uh, developer and no one thinks about a woman. And, um, and that's, again, is a problem. Whenever I go to schools and ask, so who here does a women engineer or a female software developer? Usually the, the percentage, it depends a little bit on where you are, but usually the percentage is actually very, very, very low. And that again is a problem. So um, basically one of the reasons why we don't have that many uh, software developers right now, and we don't have that many studying to be software developers, has to do with stereotypes, have, has to do with role models, and, and this, this is something that we have to uh, change from very, very early on. Um, it's not enough just to go to schools when, uh, when they are in the 12th grade and try to help them make that decision. Um, we need to start much early, much earlier, and that starts with the stories that we tell, the examples of the, the female role models that we have, and we haven't done enough uh, on that space. Uh, just one more thing that I think also it, uh, it is important. Uh, uh, one of the things, so here in, uh, so I am a professor in uh, the Technic. Technic is the, the largest school of engineering in Portugal. And, uh, um, and we, we do, quite a lot of things uh, trying to attract more uh, girls to school. I will talk about that later. But one of the things that I think that uh, can influence what Ines told is to change a little bit the mindset, uh, meaning that uh, show that uh, probably it's true 
that a, um, a girl or a woman doesn't like uh, computers that just because she is nerd. She likes computers probably because she finds that is a way uh, to do other things. Because really an engineer is a person that learns how to think and that is able to do lots of things. And uh, therefore, I think one of the things that we also, I agree with all that, so don't, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> uh, I agree with everything that Ines told. Uh, I think that uh, women are very good in programming. They are very organized and they are very focused. So they program very well when they do the program. But in addition, I think that we must show girls and since the very beginning, because this is a problem of mindset. So we must show that uh, to be uh, an engineer or to be a technician or to be uh, to study mathematics or any uh, is a job that has a lot of diversity. So she's, she will be able to acquire um, uh, to, 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 to acquire, um, uh, you know, uh, how to do different things and to be uh, also imaginative, like an architect. So we cannot put, okay, it's an engineer, so she is a nerd and she doesn't, she is not creative. No, this is wrong. I, I agree with, with everything that, that uh, both Inez and, and Elena have said. The asymmetries that, that have been generated through many years of history, you know, towards, you know, the cultural aspect, social aspect, educational systems, I agree with, with all of them. I'm just thinking a step ahead, correcting the, the, the problem, correcting this situation is going to take several years also, and it, it's going to have to be made through several areas, not just on the schools, but at, at several different levels. And I recently read a study, I think it was, it was from Microsoft internally, and we know that about 48% of women that are in tech made this career choice out of passion for the industry. And then another 35 because they wanted to work that gave us those guarantees, those stability that, that Elena was, was mentioning in the beginning. So for us, it's crucial that we give this spark, we create this spark for technology, for being a software developer engineer, for being um, on this area since early, early stage, um, not on their career, early stage on their educational system uh, from early age. That's why we invest in you know, do it girls, IT girls, and um, uh, a lot of the, in the STEAM schools and universities, IT girls, DG girls, uh, girls who code, uh, there's a lot of investments that we do in all those areas to start that spark, to start that um, love for technology that that we see that in 50, almost in 50% of the cases is needed to follow this this career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, all of you, because it's it's really interesting um, what what you are what you are saying here, and and it makes. It makes a lot of sense, and and yeah, it's it's uh, it's a shame um, as well as Ines was saying, like uh, in Ada Ada Lovelace in the 1840s, uh, she was already creating the first uh, basics for for a computer program. Then we had the Enya girls, um, and I was reading uh, as well this article um, I'm using for for a research that I'm that I'm doing um, about how women were considered the, the pioneers and even a uh, cosmopolitan in 1967 created an article saying the the computer girls uh, so basically they were putting pictures and they were featuring as a, an amazing career for women and a lot of women were were joining the profession and if you see the graphs there were so many more than than the ones are today and um, all of these was, were actually what, what really, um, I shared this with, with Madalena as well. I was gonna, uh, it, it makes me so upset because what this, there is this, um, this professor from Indiana University that discovered that he started pulling out data. He's an expert on, on computer science history. 
about they were ads targeting to change the mindset. Um, so, so there were actually campaigns from, from uh, some companies saying that women were inefficient, uh, that they get pregnant. Uh, so I will, uh, if you see the images from, from the ads, on that time you realize like um, if they were pushed away. It was not something that women, they were not passionate about it or, or they didn't fit the, like the stereotypes were starting to be created when the profession started to get like the recognition and uh, and they were actually being pushed uh using using media and as well as many other things as Ines was saying with the with the test uh, they started creating those stereotypes uh, and the test actually that started to be used were shared between university you know these uh, associations in the university like the in in the in the u.s and they obviously women were not part of those groups. So it just basically where it was an entire campaign to, to push them away from the profession. And, and that's one of the things that I personally want to reverse because this was done in one way. Now it's our responsibility as a society. I'm not blaming men or whoever. I'm not looking for anyone to blame. I'm just saying we all of us together need to, need to reverse that, uh, that gap. Uh, because actually it's, it's um, uh, they were saying that in 20, by 2020, uh, there's, going, there's going to be a deficit of tech workers. Actually, this year, there's already 70,000 um, workplaces that cannot be filled. Even after Corona, there is still uh, a demand for, for engineers. Um, so it's, it's uh, how come, like... It's gonna be and it's gonna be growing uh, on the years because it, technology is ever. I mean, it's gonna keep growing, and there are gonna be more demand for for people to fill up these positions. Um, so it's for sure is is a really good profession for women, and we are gonna need women to join. Um, so what what will be in your opinion? What I would like to know is how can we encourage more young girls and young women uh, to choose computer science instead of the more typical choices for, for a woman? Since everyone started already, I'll start now. We'll go around. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree with you. There's about 33% of technology jobs worldwide that are going to be unfilled due to talent shortages. Learn that. <laughs> and, and we see it here in Portugal, we have around 100 jobs opened in Portugal under Microsoft and we have very difficulty, we have difficulty finding the professions to fulfill these opportunities, right? And we know that the world is changing. There's a lot of roles of jobs that are not gonna exist in the future, but these are the roles that are here and we are having a lot of difficulty filling out these vacancies. And of course, we always uh, try to have diverse candidates. It is a must have at Microsoft. Whenever we open a position, we need to have uh, diverse can candidates as a compulsory um, for all job openings. But as you said, it's, it's not enough. But when I think about the, the millenniums, uh, and the more I think, and I go a lot through a lot of the jobs uh, interviews, and they all want to have this connection with social impact and work for a company that has a purpose. And so I think something that the companies can also go is through this area, right? How can you appeal more to the millenniums and even to the younger generations to work for a company, to work on a role that has a purpose, that has a social impact? And of course, I'm, I'm talking about Microsoft because I work for Microsoft is the reality that I know when I think about my mission, which is to empower every person, my, my, I wish it was my, my, my company, the company I work for, uh, to empower everyone and every person on the planet to achieve more. We can only achieve our mission. We can only empower everyone. We can only fulfill this if everyone is included. If we have a fair representation of the society, of the world, of the planet, working within Microsoft. There's a funny story that I, I can share with you guys. I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago, Microsoft had these bands. This is a Fitbit, it's not the Microsoft one. We don't have them anymore. But we had a band, which is basically a tracker. And the whole engineer team was, was masculine, right? Who was developing the first prototype for the, the band. 
but they reported to a, a female manager. So the first time they went to with a prototype for the band, the first thing that the manager did was put it on the wrist, right? And as soon as she did this, the rest, the, 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 the band fell, right? Because they were all male engineers. They didn't figure out that women have a slighter, smaller wrist than men and that it needed some kind of uh, adaptation to smaller wrists. So that's why it's super important that we have diversity and inclusion within all the companies, that the companies have a purpose and that everyone feels included and feels valued on the companies that they work for. But I agree with you, there's a big stigma still about, oh, it's too geek, it's too nerdy, it's a male, uh, it's a male role. Uh, but at Microsoft, we, we try to do everything within our, our ability to, to try to to deviate the stigma, we have unconscious bias trainings uh, very frequently, more than once a year. We provide a lot of benefits to attract the female candidates and to attract uh, female talent. We have extended paternity and maternity leaves, breastfeeding rooms. We have a lot of things to try to, to call more people to, to the DIT world. But as I said before, there were a lot of years, and as you mentioned, there was a lot of years of stigma of, uh, of, of this repression, and now it's gonna take a long time to reverse uh, this cycle. Yeah, I also know the story, but I have a different story similar to yours. It's about the airbag. Also, the team, that um, first thought on the airbags was all males. So uh, when they tried with a shorter person, so it didn't work, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> and um, I always tell that story uh, when I'm speaking with my mates, because I think that one of the most important things is, first, this is not a women problem, this is a problem of the society. And the researchers and the teams in the research university, the researchers at the university must be diverse. They must include everybody. This means they must include white, black, women and men. They must include everybody. That's diversity. And, uh, and uh, so this is a very important thing. Um, I think that one of the things that um, uh, to encourage uh, young women to choose computer or uh, STEM, so science, engineering, mathematics, uh, is to communicate. Um, to communicate, and uh, so uh, since a very since the very beginning, since the since they are very little, uh, they must. Uh, people sometimes don't know what is engineering. Uh, what is uh, technology? What are the perspectives that uh, 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 feel like this can open? And uh, sometimes they think, oh, it's not, it's not innovative, it's not creative, and uh, therefore we must communicate and we must um, show them what they can do with the with being a technician. Another thing is. Um, we need uh, role models. Uh, if you address a young boy or a young girl, they and you ask them, uh, please name some scientists, they don't uh, give the name of a um, uh, female. They, most of them speak about Einstein and uh, males and not females. Therefore, uh, so. Uh, what uh, what we can do here in the school? So one of the things that uh, Microsoft, one of the problems that Microsoft has, is related to technical. Uh, so we need to attract more women to uh, the school, and uh, so we have uh, several programs in order to attract more women. Since uh, 2016, we are developing these programs. Uh, so. One of the things is uh, uh, addressing. Girls and boys don't know what engineering and science is. So Technic is organizing, is, is uh, pioneering engineers for a day. This means that uh, some of our staff sometimes are students, 
uh, go to high schools all around the country and explain what is a uh, mathematician, what is uh, physics, uh, what is a uh, uh, naval engineer, uh, what is electrical engineer, what is a computer engineer, and uh, they explain uh, in easy words and we try to do that since the very beginning. We also have something uh, inviting students from the high school to come here. And what we see is that when we do the summer courses, it's one week summer course, when we do for, um, when we do for people that are 13, for boys and girls that are 13, we have almost the same number of boys and girls. And when we, they are 15 and 16 and 17, much more boys come and much less girls come. So we try to change this and we try to do something like Girls at Technic. And uh, uh, so this is a program that we are starting now. And the idea is to invite them to be here for one week and uh, to join uh, several hands-on courses uh, with several uh, activities, only activities. Uh, we also do um, lectures with the female talents. We call them Women in Science and Engineering. We have, um, we invited the first one was Kim Sawyer. Kim Sawyer was a former ambassador in Portugal that created our, an organization for female entrepreneurs in Portugal. Uh, last year, we invited Leonor Bloom from Carnegie Mellon. Leonor Bloom is something very, is someone very iconic. She created the project Olympus and um, she was able to change the number, uh, the numbers at their own university. So currently women, uh, uh, comprise 50% of the undergraduate computer science major at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, I think that she was, this was very good. Um, uh, we also have um, a prize, uh, the award, uh, uh, she, the prize awards two women. It's called Prémio Maria de Lourdes Quinta Silva. Maria de Lourdes Pinta Silgo, as you know, was the first and the only woman up to now to be prime minister in Portugal. She was an IAST graduate, a graduate here from the school. And so the award is given to a role model, to, to two role models. One is someone that uh, has been trained at uh, IST and that has already a career. And uh, the other is um, a master student that already showed that she is also very uh, active and uh, uh, she uh, deserves, uh, she inspires newcomers. Uh, we have communication pro projects uh, in Facebook and, uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, European projects always. So we have, a lot of work already to attract people, to attract more women to STEM. Uh, to have more students, more female students here in the school. Yes. <laughs> yes, should I now uh, answer? Um, I think before answering directly the question, I think I would like to um, go back to what Stella was mentioning about women being pushed out of um, uh, the physically the uh, software development and technology. I'm sharing now uh, an article I think I share with everyone um, about uh, it's about the tech industry in the, in the UK and about how women were pushed out of the tech industry and how this uh, almost killed the tech industry in the UK. And there is a specific story that I really like from Dame Stephanie Shirley. She has an amazing uh, TED talk that I advise everyone to, to watch about how she was pushed out of a company. She then created a company where women were across the UK working remotely and being software developers. And then she had to change her na name to Steve to, to be taken uh, seriously. And she built a multi-billion dollar company 
uh, with women at their homes, um, the programming, in a time that remote working was not talked about, but um, software development was, being, it was possible uh, to do uh, at home. So I think it's actually very interesting and this article really uh, resonate a lot with, uh, with me. And I think going back now to what, uh, basically the question, um, I think there's a, a, something that really strikes me. If I ask you if you remember a movie that you saw with a software developer, uh, where the software developer was like the lead char character or um, even like a small character in the movie, uh, I think most of you will have a hard time finding one. I think the one that I recall is Hidden Figures, uh, which is about uh, some uh, amazing, three amazing women uh, that really changed the course of um, space exploration. Um, but that's, that's it. Basically, I don't recall anyone. But if I uh, ask you to tell me about uh, a TV series or a movie about uh, men uh, engineers uh, or a man working with computer, there are like so many uh, that it's hard to, uh, to pick one. And I think, again, role models are, uh, we, we need more role models. Uh, we, need, we need to make sure that girls, whenever they, uh, they learn about like what, like basically what's happening in the world, they know about Marie Curie and they know about Ada Lovelace and they know a lot, uh, about Grace Hopper and all these women that did uh, uh, amazing work. And, um, and not, only, uh, not only the men. And, um, and, and there's actually something that, and, and something that only recently I, I got to know is that there's, a, there's a thing called the brilliance bias. Um, so when boys and girls enter school uh, in the basically first grade and they ask to do very difficult tasks, both of them uh, basically uh, respond the same way. Both of them want to do those very difficult tasks. But when they are seven years old, if we ask again, do you want to do these very uh, difficult tasks? Usually girls basically restrain themselves and don't want to do, to do those, um, those tasks. Not because they cannot do it, but because through education and through the fact that male examples are much more common in our textbooks, gir uh, girls start thinking that they are not good enough. And I, I think this is something that along the way uh, we see a lot in, um, in schools. And this happens from the first grade to the second grade. So we need to start even before making sure there are uh, uh, enough role models um, uh, for, for women and for girls to understand that they can do it. And there are a lot of brilliant women that were written out of history, but they, they exist and they should, we should talk more about them. Um, and so, and I think another thing, like we talk a lot about like, this is being a pipeline problem. Why? Uh, companies cannot recruit more. Um, and I think uh, uh, Elena can s tell this uh, better than I can, but the number of women studying software engineering is not increasing. It's like more or less the same for the past like 10 years, even though everyone says it's increasing. I think we have this, we, we, want, we, have, we want to be so optimistic that we say like women are studying more and, and are becoming, we have see more women becoming software engineers, but it actually is not right. There was a time a long time ago that were, there were more women studying engineer that they, they exist now. And I think this is a problem. We are not solving the problem. We, uh, and the problem is actually getting worse and not, uh, and not better. So we need to address this and to address as early as possible. And then another thing is also important is to change and uh, to, to, to make sure that companies understand that when they are recruiting, they, are, they have different pro, uh, recruitment processes for men and women. Men are recruited, recruited based on potential. Women are recruited on experience. And this is a fact. Uh, there's a lot of studies that show that this, uh, this exists. But most rec uh, people working in HR, actually, they are not trained to understand and to, um, and, uh, and to recognize that they have this problem. So in the moment of recruiting a man or basically someone, the way the, the, that recruitment process is done is, um, is different. And so basically from the very early start on their careers, there's already a, a difference going on. And then this becomes even worse uh, later on. I see uh, because of the work that we do at Portuguese Women in Tech, uh, a lot of girls, women come to me and say like, ah, the, my first job interviews out of college, I was asked, if I was one of those that wrote the reports or I was actually participating in the development of the, of the, of the, 
of the solution of the uh, what we were working on. A lot of them ask, uh, told me like, ah, so they asked me about my hearings, they asked me about uh, my clothing, they asked me about why did I, be, did I become a software engineer? They asked me about so many different questions that a guy will never be asked in a, in a recruitment process. So what uh, at Portuguese Women in Tech, what we try to do, for example, we launched this, uh, this report or this booklet. This is, a, 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 we, this is actually the second edition. We, we did this booklet too, uh, with female role models to show, and we do distribute this, this in schools around the country to show that, um, there is basically there is a lot of women working technology with a lot of different profiles and you can basically be one of uh, of them uh, we also did uh, with we basically we, through our work we have done hackathons we have done awards we we feel that it is very important to give visibility to women in technology we get because that not only helps those that are already working technology but also help those that are maybe considering that as a, a as a career option and i feel it's very interesting because in our study, in the pioneer study that we did, um, w w uh, women were asked, why do you work in technology? And a lot of them um, basically mentioned a cousin, uh, a brother, um, someone close to them that was a very positive influence and basically brought them to, uh, to this field. And I think we should not um, undervalue the importance of family and the importance of like this the, the close relationships that we have around us that can basically influence us and be this role model that can then take us to the to this field so of course i, I would love to see more women in technology i i don't think that i i think whenever we talk about a pipeline problem the reason that we do that even though it exists is because it's is an easy excuse if you say like oh we have a pipeline problem so i don't need to do anything else because it's a pipeline problem and i think what we need to understand is like even though these things culturally sometimes it uh, takes a, lo a lot of time to change but we have been we all have been part of culturally cha changes that happen so fast and um, and, the, and and were made possible so i think uh, a, a bigger uh, effort in showcasing role models a bigger effort in showing women uh, in tv shows in uh, um in, in, in the movies and so on with uh, um with basically ro roles um in this in this area can definitely make a difference. Um, and uh, there's like, you, 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 Rita and Elena both told stories, and I'm going to uh, tell also a, a, a story, because uh, I think a couple of years ago, NASA was very proud that they had the first class of uh, future astronauts with more women than men. But then when it came time for the, the spacewalk, they realized that they forgot to design suits for women. So I think it's not only about, uh, this is not only about diversity because they got diversity right. They had more women than men, almost like basically 50 50, almost 50 50, but they forgot the inclusion part, which is basically building uh, or creating these spacesuits for, um, for women. And I think a lot of the times uh, these discussions go to, ah, oh, we need to have more women at the table, we need to have more women, recruit more women, we have, but we forget that we need to also to create and design environments where they will thrive. Uh, and then and that should also be a focus. Thank you very much, all of you. That was that was really, really insightful. And thank you for, for sharing the stories and for sharing your perspectives. Um, Rita, did you did you reply to this as well? Sorry. Yes. Ah, okay, sorry. It's just that I lost uh, I was sure if I was jumping in your in your but um yeah. No, I was the first one. I was the first one. Okay, okay, that's. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, actually, I, I've been uh, lately thinking a lot about about this. Well, lately, since a few years, I've been obsessed with this. Basically, <laughs> thinking about it, it's just. Uh, but uh, and I'm I'm actually um, applying for a doctorate in gender studies, and for me, my my research proposal is about this exact topic. Um, how can we reverse this artificially generated gap? How can we bring it back to what it was before or not what it was before, but create something even more inclusive right now where there are not the stereotypes associated to the profession and feminize a bit uh, what, is, what is STEM, right? And, and create in order to create more equality. So all of this really um, resonates with me. 
as well um i've been um working on i i've been doing um unconscious bias training uh for for different companies as well as as with leaning that is another of, of the communities i run and now i'm preparing one specifically for uh, human resources because i come across that problem a lot uh, i launched also my my own company to help uh, tech companies recruiting more women in tech um, to help them reach that diversity because it's a problem um, but I realized that even even when I help them to bring the the pipeline that is one of the problems that they they have it's just that this the, the unconscious bias played a big, a big role on the applications and I couldn't agree more with with everything you were saying and uh, as well Ines about women are are being hired on experience while men are higher on potential and and when I interviewed a lot of um, recruiters for and when they talk I, you can see the bias coming and, and that's what I'm coming up with this training specifically for HR because I think it's really important and, and that's one of the big um, bottlenecks we have as well and it's on the recruiting side is as well and the next one is of course on the promotion side where people is not being fairly promoted and i was reading um a few reports about this um where people is is promoted as well in in different um ways so that makes women not to stay and that's another of the of the big questions we have right like we have women like the, the few women that enter uh they, they there is a big leakage right some of them they they drop at university level because they feel a minority or they don't feel represented or they feel like that's not the place and then then when they are being recruited maybe they don't get the, the job positions that other guys that might not be as qualified at them or as prepared at them and and the leakage goes goes up 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 until until we see that then the c-suite level and number of cto's is is really low like last year i think this atomico uh, report in the state of european tech which is amazing that report uh from 150 european companies that got funding in 2019 only one had a cto and this is in europe where we think we are pretty advanced so obviously uh, the numbers show that there is a problem and um, microsoft out of the 12 countries in western europe the region where portugal is out of the 12 general managers of Portugal, Spain, you know, all the, the 12 countries of Western Europe, nine are ladies, nine. That's as high as you can get, nine. On the board of directors at Microsoft Portugal, we are an odd number, we're 11, but it's six men, five ladies. It's either to one side or the other. It used to be six, five, now it's five, six. So we're, we're doing the best. And uh, I think there's a long way to go. And I agree with you and I agree with Dinesh. But at Microsoft, we really try hard uh, to have uh, salary parity. We are at 99.8. We have levels within each of the roles that we're doing, which means that once you get on that career trajectory, you will evolve at the same rate and at the same level as, as your peers. And we have an equal opportunity um, uh, we have an equal opportunity for all employees. It doesn't matter what is your race, what is your gender, what is your sexual orientation, what is your religion. It's an equal opportunity for all employees. But, um, but I know that not all companies are Microsoft and not all companies have all these laws and all these, all these rules that we need to, to comply with and that there's a lot of discrimination still mm. happening outside. Yeah, and, and I would like to ask this since I have you here, um, Rita. Uh, why uh, why did you decide to take the leap and become the CFO of Microsoft? Like, do you always wanted like no? Do you do you know what you wanted to achieve? Uh, yeah. Things like what kept you motivated in the hard times? Uh, who helped you the most? Did you have a mentor? Is there anything you wanna you wanna comment, please? So something that it's really important that it's not just for me, the, the moment that you join a big multinational, Microsoft, for example, we have two sets of things that you need to do from first day that you join the company. One is your skill development plan and the other one is your career development plan. And it's up to you to determine where you want to be and what you want to achieve, right? It starts with your own introspection. 
And when I first joined Microsoft 15 years ago, you know, I was a junior analyst and, you know, they asked me, what do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, like, oh, I don't know, the pressure, you don't know. And I put CFO, I want to be the CFO of Microsoft Portugal. But I was years away, right? I right? went 12 years before I got the job. But it's what you do about the, how you go about your career plan, how you go about your skills gap to achieve the role that you want to be. You can start as a junior engineer and develop the skill set that you need to rise to be the general manager of Microsoft. And, and I think that is crucial, not at Microsoft, but in all the companies that you work with, to really understand where you stand in the hierarchy, where is the skill set that you can leverage, what is your skill gap that you need to work on to achieve where you want to be. And of course, as you go through the roles uh, within the company, it's important that you gain mentors, uh, that you get sponsors. It's something that is super important, especially when we're talking about minorities being a woman again, any kind of diversity. It's important that you have sponsors, uh, someone who is high in the hierarchy that can pull you up, that can pull you to the right projects, that can bring you up to the big leagues and show you how is the path that you can build to, to achieve your dream goals. So it's, it's super important that you invest in yourself to achieve what we want to achieve. And so if I think about 15 years ago when I started and I put that I wanted to be the CFO of Microsoft, I, I, I never thought I would do it. I, it took me 12 years. I started here in Portugal. I went to Seattle, I went to Paris, I went to Brazil, I went to Miami, I went to Madrid. And finally, when the role opened and I had developed all the competencies that I, I needed, I got my dream job. But this is something that uh, some people come up to me and say, oh, but you were very lucky you got the job. It's not about luck. It's about hard work. It's about planning ahead. It's about making a self-decision of how much you want to invest in your career, right? I could have chosen to say, hey, I don't want to move Portugal and my prob the probability of reaching CFO would be very slim because how would I do this, the leap between being you know, a small analyst or a junior analyst from the CFO? The opportunities, it's a small country. The opportunities that exist in our country are very slim. It's important to do international rotations, to get more visibility, to get more exposure to other variables, you know, dollar availability, FX fluctuations, Corruption, well, we have some in Portugal too, but it's bigger in the emerging market. But it's, it, it's good to have all those international experience to then leverage once you come back and you get better rates at tax, 20% for people who return. Um, but it's important that we invest in our, in our career to make the, the right conscious, right? Because what is right for me may not be what is right for a peer of mine. The, the, the willingness in the investment and the... the the, the, the time consuming and the travel that I'm willing to put in may not be the same as anyone else. So it's important that we, we, we understand our boundaries and we understand what are the, the investments that we are, we, are, we are keen on doing. But again, having a mentor, having a sponsor, have a clear understanding where we want to go and how we want to achieve it and how to get there, for me, has been, has been crucial. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for 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 sharing. Uh, what about? Uh, oh, I, I, yeah. So, what about um, Elena, for example? Did you did you always wanted knew that you wanted to be a professor and a researcher on on STEM subjects? Yes, but not in STEM sub subjects. I am a researcher on electrical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> That's my career. My career is to be an electrical engineer. Electrical engineering. Okay, and uh, then uh, I I looked at what is happening here in school, and uh, uh, I think that what Rita said is super important. Very, very, very important. Uh, the percentage of so. Um, I have a lot of things to say, but <laughs> Ines told something that is important about the school here in the numbers here. The first thing we did was to study the numbers that we have, because we have 11,000 students here, so we have 
a lot of data. We have uh, uh, a lot of professors and a lot of researchers and a lot of everything. Um, but 35%, uh, so in, in, an, in an average, 28% uh, now are women uh, to enroll uh, in our uh, schools. Uh, and uh, for a PhD, we reach, uh, let me see numbers, 35 or 37. But this is for all engineering, meaning that we have some careers like architecture or biology where there are a lot of women. And we have others like uh, uh, computer engineering where the um, uh, percentage is only 10%. So you are right, Inish. Uh, the numbers keep very low and we have to do uh, things. Uh, we have to work a lot on that uh, subject. What uh, I want also to speak about is about the career. So as you know, the academic or the research is a very demanding one. And the percentage of women in the career is about uh, 25%. But the number the percentage of people that arrived to the full professors to become full professors are only 8%. When the career is very demanding, when you need to show the others and only there is only one place to go on, to, 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 to go, uh, to increase in the ladder, to go up, um, it's always a man that is chosen and not a woman. So we must to have something more proactive, like quotas or something, in order to uh, become mandatory that uh, women can reach that status. We are doing something that is very important. Some people like Ricky have the mind correct. They know that they must go outside, they must think a little bit out of the box but we must do mentoring here in the school. So since the first beginning, when they become a researcher in the first position, when they just have a grant, a postdoc grant, or they are master students, we must do some mentoring because mentoring is very important to change the mindset, to show that women are able to reach the top and they are as good as men. Uh, another thing that is very important is to give conditions. We have something that is that I want to share with you. I think it's very innovative, and I think it on, only here in the school uh, we do that. So, if you are a teacher, it doesn't really matter if you are a man or a woman, but if you have a child, you have six months uh, of leave, okay? Here in the school, you have, if you are a teacher, if you are a professor, you can have six months more, one semester, without giving classes, only to do research. Why? Because after having a children, a child, the world changes at home, okay? So, uh, in order to compete with the others, we must be very good, and but we must have time. And if start, if we have to give the classes, the courses, it's very difficult because we have 100 students before us and we have to prepare and we don't have time. So the research goes back and we are evaluated because we write papers, because we go to the uh, workshops, because we show ourselves and we show how good we are. So we must be able to help people that have child. So we have help uh, and we have that for the, so uh, when we have a child, we might be one year at home just doing research or uh, the first six months uh, uh, with the child. So we are facing a lot of problems and uh, we want to mobilize everything, uh, everyone. Uh, and this is very difficult. It's very difficult to make the school understand that this is not a problem for women, that this is a problem for everybody. This is the most difficult thing to make my, my colleagues understand 
what my colleagues and even the students to understand that this is not a problem for women, this is a problem for the whole society. And I don't know how to do it. I try to, but <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> okay. I, uh, Should I? Yeah, uh, yeah. That, I was well? just like I was just thinking so much about what you were sharing. It's uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The same, like yeah. I would, I would like to ask the same question for like a question as well for for Ines. Uh, if if you always, why did you decide to take the leap and 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 found a Portuguese woman in tech and. And how was your journey always uh, as well uh, towards reaching this this point? I think uh, I think I would like to um, before answering directly the question I would like to talk about. I think there is something that is a big lie in our society, and uh, we all want to believe in it. And uh, I think we are all try forced to believe in it. And I think it enters a lot our vocabulary that we, and we believe that companies are a meritocracy. And we believe that people are, um, are promoted because they uh, are very good at what they do and they are very good and they work very hard. And, uh, and even though that's a lot of times that's true, um, I, there is a lot of studies that show that companies are not a meritocracy. What they are most of the times is a meritocracy where it's a mirror, not necessarily, but the eye promotes people that are uh, that, that are similar to me, not necessarily the ones that are the best. And we usually are very, women uh, and minorities, and I hate to call women a minority because uh, it's, we are not necessarily minority in most countries. Uh, but in the workplace, a lot of times it happens, uh, happens that um, women, basically women are not promoted to, uh, to, basically to leadership positions, and not because they are not very good, but because they are not the, the, uh, like the ones that are doing the promotions. And so, and another thing that I also is very important to say is like, for example, in Portugal, women spend per day 90 minutes more working than men. And a lot of those, uh, basically most, uh, the total of those 90 minutes plus some are actually doing work that is unpaid. So 75% of, uh, of the work uh, of the work done uh, at home is, uh, or, the, or the work at home is done by women of the care, of the child care, parents care, um, uh, girls, uh, buying groceries and so on is done by women, which leaves less time for focusing on career and focusing on, um, on basically um, of reaching those leadership positions. There, are, there is a study in Sweden. So Sweden has a system where uh, they have maternity and paternity leave and where paternity leave is mandatory um, and basically men need to take that paternity leave and basically for uh, the, uh, for basically if men take more months women make 70 seven percent more money for the each month than men take uh, which is actually very interesting that shows that so basically a lot of women are very um, um, how, we, how we call it they, they Basically, the fact that women they, uh, have kids and then spend a lot of time at, uh, basically at home um, really has a, a very big impact at their income and their basically their future careers. And I think we have to take all the, all this in consideration when um, and when organizations are designing like systems and and, and policies. As Elena was mentioning, this this is very important. Basically, make sure that if the the woman has a kid, so has more basically doesn't take it doesn't. Uh, the classes so it has has more time for research unfortunately in most places that doesn't happen and um and most companies that that's not the case um, and so there's a, like i think there's a lot of even though we are made to believe this exists this meritocracy exists that's uh, again is uh, that's is not true and uh, and i think it's we need to basically to to uh, to understand that a lot of times um a lot of i remember when people asked me like in the beginning when we started she's been in tech and said, oh, have you ever felt discriminated? And my answer would be no. I said, oh, no, I never felt. But then I start looking at the behaviors around me and looking at how people would treat me in meetings and would, and, and some, sometimes even like the small, com uh, like the smallest comments. And then we could see exactly like what discrimination means. We just need to be aware. Otherwise, we just are so used to the behavior that we don't even notice. Um, and so 
in 2016, when we started Portuguese Women in Tech, was because we wanted to give visibility to women in technology. How can we show the women that are working in technology every day, working, particularly developing products, but that, but that for some reason don't have the, that visibility? We did that, but then we realized that we needed to do much more, and, we, we should, and it was important to do much more. And then we start doing projects like the ones that I've taught before, but also projects like the speakers list where we have 300 names of women in technology in Portugal that could speak in events. It doesn't make sense anymore to have an, uh, uh, an event where about technology, uh, uh, where only, only, we only have men. Women are also in this area, they should also be able to, to speak. In this, uh, in this event. We also launched the transparency, uh, the salary transparency list where women, uh, basically the gender gap has a lot of reasons. Um, uh, 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 some of them are because this experience and the uh, potential uh, thing. Another one is because it, it happens after maternity, uh, after ha women having kids, um, but also a lot of them uh, that, that happens in the negotiation phase. Women are usually not so willing to negotiate their salaries and even worse when they do negotiate they are they are seen as very aggressive and um, and bossy uh, which is uh, it goes against them men if men do the same they are seen as um, someone that you want to have on your, on your team because they will fight for you so basically this uh, difference of perception has a, a very impact in the gender pay gap so we launched this, this uh, tool where women can see what, how much men and women make um, in their in, in their city or in their uh, their, uh, their um, role and in the, with their uh, time of uh, years of experience um, and of course we want to launch more uh, more initiative initiatives until now we were very much focused on this basically supporting women in technology and making sure that we attract more women to technology in the future we also will focus on female uh, entrepreneurship how can we support more women to become entrepreneurs uh, because i think something that we didn't talk here and a lot of the times i i get asked this question is like why are you fighting for more women in technology and the reason i'm doing it is not because i feel like i think for me anyone can study whatever they want and work for, on whatever they want i just want to make sure uh, basically i know that we don't make decisions in a vacuum so basically it means that the people that we have around us, the role models, everything influences very much what, what we are going to choose as a career. And then if technology is the area, and Rita was mentioned this, like the fact that it, with COVID-19, technology is the area that is, keeps on growing. Basically, if that's the area that keeps on growing, if we, we want to reduce the gender pay gap uh, and the gender gap in general in the future, we need to have more women in technology. It's not the question of like liking more of this area and liking less of that area. It's a question of numbers. Wealth creation is happening in technology. So we need women to be in technology. So we have a chance of uh, closing the, the gender pay gap. So I think this is also, this, this is very important for us to basically to discuss and, uh, and acknowledge. And we basically in the work that we are doing in Portuguese Women in Tech has a lot to do with this. Hopefully we'll be able to do more. And basically we are now, uh, we have now a book club and you are part of it. So uh, uh, you, you know about it. And um, the, book, the book that we are going to discuss this, uh, next, this Saturday, it's, I have it here, it's called Invisible Woman. Um, it's about um, the gender gap, uh, the, sorry, the data gender gap, the fact that we don't have that much information around women and how that has a, a big impact in the workplace, at home, uh, in the in, in men and so on, and so on. So I think this is super super important to make sure that uh, we understand exactly the conditions that we have in place and we are able to take the policies and the system change uh, to make this uh, basically make change happen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm actually super excited that. Um, and we are going to discuss this on Saturday um, because all the books that they were recommending from the Portuguese Woman in Tech from book club, I, I read uh, most of them, only one, the one I'm, I'm, uh, that I chose from there. Um, and, I, and I think it's really important to create conversation and awareness on this. So I think um, everything you ladies have shared is, is super important. And I would like to, I, we can stay here forever talking because I've, obviously this is really close to our hearts and, and, and it's a subject that deserves a lot of importance. And 
and I'm glad also uh, that, that we had that this space uh, to talk. And I would like to, to close down uh, for today with, with one last thing. That is, what's the message uh, for all the people that is listening to us today and that will see this recording? Uh, what is the one action? One action that they can take to achieve gender equality, wherever they are a man or a woman? What is one thing they can do now? Who wanna go first? <laughs> I can go first if no okay, one goes. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, I think there is no one action, there is no silver bullet. And I think that's the, the challenge here. There's like no one thing that we can do. What I'm trying to do is on one hand, if I see uh, discrimination happen, uh, and sometimes it's the smaller things. I'm going to tell you a story. So a couple of years ago, I went to um, a supermarket in Portugal and basically the, uh, I, I will look at the magazine stand and it says men, so a society and then female and fashion. And basically the men, the men magazines were uh, Marketeer, Visão, Exam and others. The female magazines were Maria, uh, Ana Maria, Caras and so on. And so basically they were discriminating me because if I wanted to uh, buy Visão, what they were saying that that is a men magazine. So what I did was to mix the old magazine uh, <laughs> between each other. So there, I was the crazy woman at 10 p.m. at night in the supermarket mixing all the magazines. And then I sent a picture of that, of that uh, stand uh, to people that worked at that, that company. And now if you go to that supermarket that I won't say the name, you don't have that anymore. So they took out the men and the female and they, they, they basically they, they replace it with other things. And I think this is the small things that we can do. Something else that I do is like I have, I fortunately have a, a big family and I have a lot of cousins that are now having babies and uh, whenever they are having a baby I give them a, 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 basically a book called um, Bedtime Stories for Rebel w w uh, Girls. Uh, it's a book about, basically it's a book about women that throughout history have some, basically plays, uh, uh, play some role. It's not only the um, the sleepy beauty that is saved by the Prince Charming. It's basically the Marie Curie's and the Grace Hopper and all those amazing women that um, for some reason, those stories are not told enough. And I want my, my little cousins to be, uh, to grow up knowing that from basically very early on that they can be whatever they want to be. Um, and there's like those, all these amazing women out there uh, doing this, uh, this work. Um, and of course, I will continue to do uh, uh, our, our work with Portuguese Women in Tech. And I think, I think the discussion should be ha should be have not based on emotion or not based on like oh, I should I, I think this is the way or that is the way. I like to have discussions based on hard data, and that's why we have this book club. Uh, in the book club, we chose books that are uh, some of them are like more data driven that like the one that i showed that will be our first discussion uh, others are about more like the history uh, other, another book that we, we we have is called the time is has come it's about how men should actually also join this uh, this fight for uh, for equality um and so basically our our, our role uh, and our job also here at portuguese women tech is not to put uh, put many uh, men away so also like how can we together actually achieve this because it's uh, in the end it's good for everyone it's good for the economy there's a lot of show uh, a lot of mckinsey articles uh, saying that uh, if women worked and had the same access as as men um, in the workplace that would increase the global GDP by 12 trillion dollars or whatever. So there's like a lot of positive things out there that show that women should have a place in our society. It's, it's a question of like us taking the necessary steps. Thank you. When I go, I mean, when I meant the one action is like something actionable, but thank you for giving us so many ideas, especially the supermarket one. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. But uh, yeah, thank you for, for all the work you do at Portuguese Women in Tech. I really followed you and I'm part of, of the group and I, I love uh, absolutely everything you do there. And, and it's, it's really like, well done. Um, so we want to go now, um, Rita or uh, Elena? Yeah. I can go like super quick because uh, I have to go dinner. 
uh, super quick. I think one for sure is to create the taboo, to create this uh, this awareness that tech is a male a male stigma. I, again, I don't have the silver, silver bullet, same thing as Inish, but I think it's super important to continue to work on it. The second point is, of course, to create that spark that I talked about in young age, in girls, and keep it light, not just when they're seven, which I'm doing with my, my girl right now, but to keep it light until they, it's time to go to college so that we, we have more women uh, entering the technical, uh, for instance. And then uh, the third one is once we do have women in tech to make sure that we are mentors, if we are more senior in, in the profession, that we embrace uh, the, the mentees, that we coach them and that we help them to develop and to create a career to be successful and that um, they can progress and then tell the story. And, and, and then it's just, it's gonna be a, as we say in Portuguese, right? It's, it's a circle, right? The more women we have in higher places, the more examples we have, the more mentees we're gonna have, the more people uh, are gonna join. So that was my, my contribution. Yeah, that there is no one like a silver bullet. I, I we wish we, it was that easy, right? That is a uh, definitely a complex uh, program. My, if to decrease my Microsoft, please join Microsoft. Send send us your CVs because we need. It. So sorry, that was not a part. But if you do want to work for Microsoft, send us the CVs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we will we will make sure to promote within our networks as well your your job openings. So I don't have uh, uh, I don't have uh, either a lot of to say. Just be proactive. I think that everybody said what has to be said. We all know that this is uh, this will take time, a lot of time. If we don't do, if we are not proactive, it even takes longer and uh, uh, after what um, uh, uh, Inesh uh, said or Rita said before going to Microsoft please go to Technico <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I wanted to, to ask Madalena what is your one action and the ladies uh, that are uh, joining us today if you want to go on the chat to to share your, your one action. Um, for me, my one action will be um, to have a workshop about negotiation. Ne oh, I'm, I'm also now negotiating your salary uh, next month uh, for women uh, with, the, with one, of, uh, one of the ladies. I know that she's an expert on salary negotiation. And one of my friends actually uh, negotiated negotiated a new job and she is gonna get paid double that what she was making before. So I'm definitely bringing her to do a specific um, workshop for, for, uh, for our uh, woman in tech community here in, in uh, Portugal. Anyway, Mandalena, you wanna? Can I just say something on the salary? Sorry, I only negotiated my salary once in my lifetime once i had never negotiated until a point where i was offered a new position and i felt you know what i'm worth more than this and i negotiated back and i got an increase of 40 percent mm -hmm. yeah because the school paid for and all those things so i said you know what after now after then i negotiate always my salary always i don't care if you if i'm the right candidate you need to pay the price and that's the thought. That's what I, tell, what I tell all my interns, everyone who works with me. If you're the right candidate, the company will pay the price. And that's it. Sorry, I needed to say this. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for sharing that because I think it's really important. I, I recently talked to a recruiter from a, a big company and he was um, telling me like, woman doesn't negotiate. And actually he told me a story that one lady he she, she asked him oh by the way is my salary negotiable and he was like mm. well i don't know well we can see we can see but basically he told her yes but she never negotiated so yes that's my that's my 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 push for my one action for today i actually agree with with what rita said she's that's not i will think of something else but uh, building on what you said rita i i used to work with 
a, a very successful, I had a, like a very successful female boss and I would watch her negotiate in meetings and ask the thing that I would like literally run out of the meeting and go like, oh my God, I cannot believe she asked for that. And everything she asked for, she got. She would negotiate everything and ask for like, like 50% less of what she wanted to pay or 50% more of what she wanted to be paid. And everyone said yes all the time. So, I mean, I would go confidently. That would be one of the advice. And building on what someone said on the Q&A section and what I answered, to, to have a more inclusive and equal, uh, equalitarian environment, look at where you are all the time and think, how can I make this more inclusive? It doesn't matter if you're in the HR department or in a position of power or not. Um, try to make change wherever you are and, and, and look out not only for your peers, like if you're a woman, look out not only for women, but for minorities, for uh, different ethnicities and people with different disabilities and just look at, pe look at the environment around you and, and try to make it better. That's good. So we have here Ikuska, uh, who says hire a second female developer at the startup I work at. Uh, we hired the first one two months ago. Good. And we have, okay, we, Ellie is asking what is your advice on how to negotiate. I'll send you the link uh, with the, the, we still haven't published the negotiation um, workshop, but I'll share the link to the Lean In. This is under the umbrella of Lean In that I'll do. Rita, uh, create a showcase, demonstrate your skills. And uh, Silvana says mentoring girls from seven to 17 at Girl Coders in Estocolm. That's good, amazing. Um, is there any questions that got not answered? Uh, I think we are running out of time. I, yeah, I think we uh, at least, I mean, everyone got at least one answer to everything that was posted. So yeah, it's just the one on, on how to negotiate that still to be answered, but you'll okay. send the link. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, let me put the link here. And then, well, I would like to thank, uh, I will share now, yeah, the Lean in Portugal uh, Facebook page um, where you can see the events. I haven't published it yet, but I will publish it next week. It's just um, for the negotiation. It's going to be on the 9th of July. Uh, the workshop we just uh, closed it today i'm just checking just to make sure yeah it's on the 8th, 8th of july at 7 p.m it's gonna be the negotiation workshop so just join lean in portugal um we also have a, a group for for women and portuguese women in tech they also have an amazing facebook group and a lot of lot of things um join microsoft and join instituto tecnico we are all waiting for you and please share with the ladies around you. There is also this program running tomorrow and after tomorrow for the engineers for uh, I think there are some sessions yes. coming up tomorrow and after tomorrow. Uh, so if you know someone with kids, uh, girls, just please share it, share this initiative. They also have a Facebook page. I don't know if I, but um, yeah, just please make sure you create awareness around you um, and let's change the numbers all of us together. So thank you very much again to, to all of you, Elena, Rita, and Ines, for your time, for your passion, for your commitment, everything you are doing, and for your time today and being so open and so honest and so authentic. And everyone who is uh, joining also that has been on the chat, that maybe uh, I hope you all feel more inspired today. And um, thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye. 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 Bye.